Hey y'all, welcome back to Low Power Mode with Breezy. I've got a very warm, fuzzy episode for you today, so let's get it going. I got an excess of black bile, high irascibility, contemplating checking myself into facility, mental ability clearly affected, deep in the dumps, down and dejected. I've been in low, 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 low power mode, in low power mode. Been in low power mode all year. Thing is, time to switch it up to high gear. I've been in low, 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 low. I've been in, 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 in. I've been in, I've been in low power mode all year. Thing is, time to switch it up to high gear. All right, welcome back. So, it's been a really dynamic week. A lot has gone on. Um, Hard things, positive things, fun things, scary things, um, good things. So, uh, yeah, I I definitely felt like I I needed a warm, fuzzy episode. I needed to be surrounded by artists that I love so much and hold so close to the chest. Like, I needed that. So... We're going to kick it off with music. Music. Yeah. All right. And so for music today, I want to talk about the one, the only, Jasmine Sullivan. Now, if you're not up on Jasmine Sullivan, that's okay. <laughs> there is hope for you now. Jasmine came onto the scene. Okay, first of all, uh you know, we have we have people who sing songs in the music industry, and then we have singers, we have vocalists. And Jasmine is the latter. She is a proper singer, vocalist, extraordinaire. And she's been, you know, she she had the gift from a very young age. And she put out her first project in 2008, second in 2010 had some momentum um, in 2015 with her album Reality Show, and then she took a six-year break. She's from Philly, from Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Philly's a Philly's a great city, and I feel like she 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 stuck around. You know, she she stuck around her community, her people, her folks, and. So Jasmine is so special. She's she's an artist artist as well. Not just a vocalist, not just a singer, but someone who writes her own stuff and who experiences things and also who capes for black women. Now, of course, she is a black woman, but not everyone has that agenda in the music industry. And I super appreciate, like I was just looking at interviews on YouTube and I found this interview um I think it, it it's a drug having to do with breast cancer that was that she was like partnering with and she was speaking up about black women and how systemic racism affects black women's experiences with cancer and uh and so oh my god I like I'm I'm uh, like on top of it, she's a she's such a beautiful person who's like trying to give back and everything it's like damn. You know, I I don't I don't go I don't say go out and buy like every album that I talk about on this podcast, but go out and buy Hotels from Jasmine Sullivan. Go out and buy it. Well, you don't need to go out these days. Click 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 purchase and buy the album. It is a work of art. If there was a museum for music from black women, you know, throughout the ages, Jasmine would absolutely be there. That's, I think that's what's exciting in our world of such overload of, of different artists, excuse me, of different, um, styles. Uh, everyone can make music now. So there's a lot to kind of wade through, sort through, and she just cuts right to the top for me and I feel like 
I can trust her. And um, so she took a six-year break between her album Reality Show in 2015 and Hotels in 2021. And luckily, I I was I was up on hotels like when it came out, so it it really defined last was it summer for me? I think it was last summer, and um, and I don't know if there's I don't know if you can hear the noises from outside, but I'll pretend that you can't. So um, so yeah, it was just it's just one of those albums that once you hear it, you 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 have to hear it again, and um. So it is called Hotels. I'm I I don't really fit the profile in terms of uh in terms of like necessarily the image, but the thing is when you I think when you get specific and you're aligned with the work that you're doing, the art that you're putting out, that it doesn't matter. And I would I would say like that this is an album for black women, but I would also say that this is an album for everyone, including white men. Um, she, oh, it's so raw. And she, knowing that she, she really, she took this time to work on who she is and, and healing herself. I think after reality show, she said in an interview that she wanted to learn who she is without a microphone pen and paper. And I, I just, I really, I just respect that so much given where I'm at right now with the music journey, because it takes it, it, you're pouring in everything you have for now in her case, she's been successful, but still you don't know what the returns are. Um, and so you really, you have to be, you have to be ready especially when you're the type of artist who doesn't have other people necessarily writing for you or there's like a wheel that you're a part of like when like her mo- her mother's her manager and um it's it's close close to home her her the way that she's gone about the industry so i just i respect the shit out of this woman and she also um has shared that she's been in an an abusive relationship um, her mother sh- battled with breast cancer for many years. Um, she has, I think she has a really tight like group of like supportive family and friends around her. And I, lo- I like, you need that. You really need that as a black woman in the music industry. Um, so it was, it's just been, it's been cool because I think her fans, She's so vulnerable and so honest that her fans like get it. They get that, you know, we are lucky when she feels aligned and wants to give us something. She's like, she's really like a like a Beyonce in her own vein, where she has such a dedicated following that we will we will sip slurp up anything that she gives us. So Hotels is such a masterpiece of an album. Um it's so poetic and there's six interludes. Um, it's just, oh my God, it's just, uh, it speaks to the experience of, um, women spelled with an X, Wimex N, you know, it's like super inclusive, um, and vulnerable in these interludes. And I think, for for people who have had the experience of being conditioned and socialized as a as a woman as a as like a cisgender woman um it's oh god it's tough it's tough because you know we live in a patriarchal world patriarchal world so we're constantly shaming and tearing down femme and heightening and lifting up mask. And so I don't want to be exclusive to trans men when I say that. I I mean like mask in society, there's just less expected, you know. 
um, of femme. And so, so I forget where I was going with that. Oh yeah. That this, that this really speaks to that experience of, of being raised as a woman, like questioning your, yourself, questioning your, your, why someone doesn't want you or want to fuck with you anymore. Um, um, uh, it's just so good. She has a collaboration, uh, a song called On It with R&B singer Ari Lennox. And Ari is also such a powerhouse. Um, and perhaps like a, a bit more, I forgot to mute my sound bites again. <laughs> okay. Um, so Ari Lennox is a tad more... Oof, ugh, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know how to compare them, but they're amazing. They 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 met, they vibed, and then they did this collaboration, um, I think virtually, and Ari gives an interlude as well. But they do this song on it. The cor the chorus is like, I wanna sit on it. <laughs> um and like I wanna spit on it and it was funny to hear. I was I was watching uh, Jasmine's interview with like Rap Genius on Hotels, and she she said like when Ari was like, "I want to spit on it." She's like, "Girl, are you? I, I don't know." And Ari's like, "No, no, no. It's like exactly the ratchetness that we need." And so, and then Jasmine she said she was laughing in the studio because she was she was like, "Okay, okay, here." here we go. Like I'm, I'm going to turn it in a gospel manner. Like we're going to take you to church, but we're talking about riding dick. So, so hilarious. So funny. Uh, so funny. Um, yeah, she's, she's so, she's so incredible. She's, she's got 15 Grammy nominations. Now we know these institutions like, are biased in like the club, you know, clubhouse and like this kind of thing. But even so, she's got 15 Grammy nominations. Like, I don't know, just killing it, killing it in the game. Uh, it's, it's like a diary. It's like a diary. And for me, I'll get to it towards the end of the episode, but I, yeah, like I really, after going in on my heart in a therapy type of form, uh, I needed to put this album on blast and just, uh, just like let it run through me. I think it's a cleansing album in that way. It's like very, 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 very different from Solange's When I Get Home. However, there's something purifying and super intimate about both of the those albums. And Hotels is just, oh, it's just, it's so musical. It's hip hop. She does a track with Anderson Pack called Price Tags. Now, I used to fuck heavy with Anderson Pack, and now I'm kind of like, man, especially since he went Silk Sonic, like, I just can't. But uh their 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 joint together is beautiful like i love that song um it's called price tags and yeah and she i think the chorus is like harness harness in my hand uh something about money like is essentially <laughs> like getting getting a man to buy you things <laughs> which I don't know. I think my opinion of what is feminist has changed so much over the years. And I used to see that, like I used to see this whole thing of women getting men to buy them things as not feminist. But correct me if I'm wrong, or like, let me know how you feel on, on this. But I feel like these days, 
uh, it's almost circling back to, was it first wave or second wave of feminism where it's like using your femininity to pull ahead. Um, I get it. Honestly, I get it. Especially living in the States for the past few months and just remembering the quality of life here. Like it's, everyone's underpaid. Everything's getting more expensive. Gas, groceries, like it feels like you're squeezed. So when you're already dealing with systemic um, racism, discrimination based off of gender and um, race, like black women do in this country, it is, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like okay, well, if you can, if you can get someone to be a bit, a bit sugar daddy for you, then like, what's the harm in that? It's almost like what, what we're owed, you know, from society, from being such a male oriented society. I was never super lucky at the bar with like drinks and stuff. Like, no one's really buying me drinks. But it's portrayed a lot in movies and in other people's lives and things. And I um, I say go for it, you know, work it, work that. Because, um, because, yeah, if you break it down, like, numbers-wise, men are getting paid more than women, so they should be buying more things for women. I don't know. Maybe I'm, like, completely just losing my understanding of feminism, but... This is where I'm at right now, and it feels fine. I love Roxane Gay's Bad Feminist. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend. Um, but it, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm definitely feminist, but there's some gray areas here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think I'm going to wrap it up with Jasmine Sullivan. Again, can't emphasize enough um, how, and again, like hotels came out in January of 2021. We just had January of 2022. So you're only like a year or so late, you know, but you gotta, you gotta add this to your playlist or, or just give it a listen, especially if you're, if you're doing any, anything close to the heart, if you're at a, at a time in your life where, that heart chakra needs some love. I would definitely throw on Jasmine Sullivan's hotels. All right, that's gonna wrap up music. Let's roll on to TV. Television. All right, we're back. Um, we're in the TV section, and this is this is more shameless standing. Okay. This is one of my favorite creators of all time, okay? <laughs> um, and again, I'm not, I'm not looking nationally. I'm looking internationally. I'm looking across the pond over at Michaela Cole. Is it Michaela Cole? Michaela Coel? I think it's Michaela Cole. Now... Oh, as an actress, she has come up the ranks in roles on like Black Mirror, and she made um, she made it into the world of Wakanda, um, the Black Panther movie. She's, I think, they're in post production for the second Black Panther movie. Um, she she is so she's such a special person. Oh, so if you don't know her story. She, her parents are from Ghana. She grew up in London and, um, she was always a poet, writer, um, thinker and, uh, doing open mics, doing, doing a lot in her community. She, she grew up very religious, um, uh, eva- is it ev- I, I think everyone's evangelist one, I think very religious, um, I forget exactly which religion it was, but it was like very, very intensely religious, a lot of church, a lot of rules. And, um, and so after kind of, uh, developing more of a sense of herself and having more time outside of her childhood experience, 
um, she she wrote a play. She wrote actually like a one, I think it started as a one woman show called Chewing Gum Dreams, okay? Then she eventually worked to turn it into a TV show. Super cool side note. Um, I was working on writing a TV show uh, last year with a friend and in researching, I came across her script. And so her TV show ended up being called Chewing Gum. And so the, the script for Chewing Gum, she's made available, but she's also like attached a short note, like a couple of paragraphs about, um, about writing for TV. And I, I want to read it because I think it's so special and amazing how, how honest and raw and frank she is. And for me, this is stuff that I need to hear like all the time, every day. I need this, this, I, I need this like, okay, how is it going for other artists? And tell me the harder side of things because that's how it feels like it's going for me. So, um, yeah, I'm going to read you, uh, the, the little excerpts that are here before her script. I wished I had read a script for a season of a show before I started writing one. In case you wish for the same or just want to read a script, here's mine. Okay, and then it says FYIs. Chewing gum was too long. I wrote too many pages. Storylines were filmed that we didn't realize were average and a bit shit until we were watching them in the edit. We had to decide as a whole team how to respond to editorial obstacles, where to cut, what to move, your job as the creator, writer, is to make sure the story still honors itself as much as possible. I say that to say, you may read plots in this gift and wonder why you don't recognize them from the series. They never made it. We killed them. Those plots were the lovable but weak villagers we terminated because they were holding us back from reaching best life and prosperity. <laughs> I, okay, so this is me, Breezy. Um, I love this. I love this behind the scenes shit, as I was saying. I love to know that if I'm going to write my story and adapt it into a TV show, that a lot is going to get lost along the way. It's really important to know that stuff up front. And now that I've experienced enough of it, it's like, okay, that is a reality of it. Does it mean don't go for it? Absolutely not. Um, so I'm going to continue. Oh God. And I, she goes, those plots were the lovable, but weak villagers we terminated because they were holding us back from reaching best life and prosperity. RIP. At 26 years old, I had never written anything for screen, never been to film or screenwriting school. I'd never worked in a team from such a position, and I had no mentor or connection in this industry. When you're an outsider and don't know the ropes, it can leave you feeling insecure and searching for the confidence needed to carry out a project that feels bigger than you. I'm often asked to mentor people. I've been thinking about what it means to mentor, and I like the idea of mentoring being about empowering others rather than breastfeeding them. I've been trying to think of a way that I could contribute to the empowering of as many people as possible and as quickly. Giving these scripts away, alongside some notes that may or may not make sense, seemed like a good start. And she ends it by, before you begin, you should watch this, which is a link to her epic Edinburgh McTaggart lecture, which... I'll put in the show notes. I don't want to go down that because it's a whole nother like train of epicness around behind the scenes of her bringing her projects to life. But this is my type of artist because she's like Issa Rae opening, like bursting through the glass ceiling and knocking it down for so many others as well and, and make, making their no secrets as to what they're doing and how they're doing it. I appreciate this so, 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 so much. And, um, and yeah, I, I felt like reading, reading this from Michaela Coel, this excerpt that she adds in before her chewing gum script, uh, gives you a really good sense of who this person is. So given that, 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 that bravery, right. To, to, bring a project to screen for the first time with no experience, no education, no like working in that capacity. Um, 
so then she, oh my God, so much, so much. So she made chewing gum. She made chewing gum with Netflix. And, and chewing gum is amazing. Highly recommend. Um, and then she was working on her next show. So her next show ended up being I May Destroy You. And that's what we're going to talk about today. She was working on I May Destroy You when there were issues going on with the network or with Netflix. And essentially she was asking for, so in the world of Hollywood and adapting things to screen, you have IP. IP stands for intellectual property. So so these production companies they are buying your intellectual property in order to, you know, make tons of money off of it from a TV show, which you will also make money off of. But you get a percentage because it's your intellectual property of what, you know, the show is going to make. And so for her, she was negotiating something as low as like 1% or half a percent or something, and Netflix wouldn't budge. So she ended up taking her... being like, no, then I'm not going to do it with you. And that is so powerful in this industry. Fuck. Like to be, to be like, no, this is mine. And you're not going to tell me how little of it I'm, I'm going to, be- I'm going to benefit from in the outcome. Like I know I can get a better deal elsewhere. That is so, so badass. Saying no, I realize is so powerful. And, um, she protected herself. She protected her intellectual property and she took it over to HBO Max. HBO Max gave her a deal she was more happy with. Um, but while she was working on writing, I May Destroy You. So writing the, the, the screenplay for I May Destroy You, she was drugged and raped and, as a result of that, she turned the story into her experience of that. So I May Destroy You is extremely meta. And it the broader theme is exploring consent and like today's sexual relationships and how things go down. And um and this, you know. Nobody wants to talk about this stuff. The people who it's happened to don't want to talk about it. Uh, the people who have com- been perpetrators don't want to talk about it. And the community does not want to talk about it, you know? And so to make a show that, to not worry about who she's appealing to, but to 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 fight to tell her story. Again, I just, I'm, I'm, like praise Michaela Coel so much because it's so hard to do that nowadays. It's so easy to sell yourself and sell bits of yourself and it's hard to hold on to who you are and negotiate and value yourself. And so she did that and she made this show. So the show is 12 episodes, 12 30-minute episodes. And... The show, the first episode starts with the trauma and by the end we're, 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 now recovery is a lifelong process, but we're reaching some level of healing and recovery. So she shares everything. She really, it's so, oh, it's so amazing because she had to go through it then she had to process it and heal from it. And then she made art out of it. And this is her, these are her stories. You know, obviously it's a character, fictional character and stuff like that, but we all know this is her. And so for her to sit in rooms negotiating with executives, you know, around things that relate to this sensitive of a story, I, I'm just like, wow, 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 wow. So I may destroy you. Uh, is about Arabella and her friends, Terry and um, Kwame. 
and they live in London and they're 20 somethings and they're, they're just doing their things. Terry's an aspiring actress. Arabella is a writer and Kwame is a personal trainer and like fitness person. And, um, but it focuses on their, their relationships, their sexual relationships. And, but, but it really focuses on their friendships as well. And it doesn't, it's not, uh, it's not just like you're seeing like every sex, I just dropped my notebook. Every sex scene really has a purpose. Um, and the storytelling is so artful. Hold on, I need to pick up my notebook. All right, we're back in business. So, um, so what I did was I kind of took notes on the episodes and what they were doing, almost like um, a beat sheet or a treatment. I don't know. I'm still kind of learning these words, but I I kind of took the episode and and broke it down to like main, main, main. What what happened in this episode? Or what's, yeah, what's a, a key part of the plot? And I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, in the past on the podcast, I've wanted to talk about what stuff means to me um, versus recapping. But I think that the story is so special and well told in and of itself that I kind of want to recap the story. Because again, this is her story. So, it's not just a story. It's a way that a real person was able to represent themselves, their experience, a vulnerable experience, and their story on screen, uh, which I also feel like is a way of healing and recovery. Um, but okay, so the first episode, the the trauma event happens. It goes down. It's basically she had been in Italy working on her script, but really, um, as she says, uh, eating, (laughs) eating dick and pizza (laughs) because she's hanging out with this guy, Biagio. So they're not really, really together, but, um, she's been hanging out with him and hasn't been working on her project. So she stays overnight at the, at the edit editorial like office to finish her script but then her friend is super excited to see her and wants her to come out. So she sets her alarm, <laughs> 20s. She sets her alarm for an hour. And she's like, okay, I'm just going to go out for an hour and then I'm going to come back and finish my story. And d- during that night out is when the event happens. So it's very, they, they do a really good job of showing how like disoriented she is. And she doesn't remember. She doesn't know. She's, she was blacked out from drugs and so she's got some sparse memories, but not really. So that's kind of the first episode. And of course, on a on a visual level, the show, it's so colorful. It's so bringing you in. It's inviting. And, um, and the music is incredible. In the first episode, she's got Lil Sims, Sampa the Great, Rosalia. Like it's, it's so good. Um, so the the pilot episode is like incredible. Then, and it's called Eyes, 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 Eyes. Then episode two, Someone is Lying. So this is her piecing together what has happened to her. Essentially, she's trying to distract herself constantly because she keeps having these memories that she can't put anything together with. And she also has a cut on her forehead. So she knows objectively that something's happened. But still, I, I love this exploration of mental health. You can see that something's happened to you. You can have a physical cut or scar and not be feeling it, not be letting yourself feel it. Uh, it's like a kid falling on the sidewalk and they scrape their knee and there's blood. And, but they're fine. They're absolutely fine until they see the blood and then they freak out. And th- that is how this episode feels. There's a scene where she's sitting down with the officers um, who are working on her case. And it's so chilling when she is describing things to them. And they're saying, okay, uh, so in your memory, and she's like, whoa, 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 don't call it a memory. It's not a memory. Uh, 
guys, this is not, she's, she's like, guys, like, why are you, you know, you're putting something, you're putting weight on something that's, you know, she's explaining to herself, she's in that state of denial, like, like, yeah, this is, this, this hasn't hit me yet. And I think, I think it's, it's, it, it can be similar, like, we're talking about sexual assault, sexual assault and rape, but it also can be similar with other types of trauma that you've experienced as well, where you experience something and you just don't fully want it to be true. So your brain does weird sort of mental gymnastics in order to deny the reality. So super powerful and really showed the doubt, the female doubt, the doubt that is put that's socialized and conditioned and all, all the gaslighting from men over the years of, of victim blaming and all that stuff. Like it really lives as a doubt that anyone with our, I, I feel like as someone with a vagina that going through the world and, and when you feel like you're off, like you're wrong, like someone checks you you have this doubt. Now, a lot of us like can work through that and see, okay, no, I'm not going to doubt myself, but it's difficult. It's so difficult, especially being a young woman. So episode three, don't forget the C. Um, This is a trauma memory. So there's three episodes where there are flashbacks for a decent amount of the episode. So it's really going in and giving context. Um, Again, I thought this was such amazing storytelling, like especially because, you know, if you have trauma event as episode one and like healing as episode 12, then peppering every few episodes with these trauma memories that add more context to the world of what's going on for the characters and the, the themes, um, just wow, like great flow. So in this episode, um, it's a flashback to when Arabella was in Italy and her friend Terry comes to visit her and they go out and essentially Terry, uh, feels uncomfortable being out and wants to leave. And Arabella has done more drugs than Terry and is more fucked up, therefore not wanting to leave, but, or not understanding that Terry was leaving. So for Arabella, this is a traumatic event because, not because of what happens, but because her friend left her when she was vulnerable. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful episode. They're in Italy. Um, but yeah, you have these moments, these messy, messy, of course, drug infused moments where small behaviors, meaningless behaviors or whatever things, decisions that we do can ultimately end up being someone's trauma. So it was, that was great. Then we have episode four, that was fun. And this is kind of around like the ignorant, this is an episode that addresses the ignorance around what what rape can actually look like. So for instance, what happens in this episode is that Arabella, um, someone from her uh, uh, um, publishing company, another writer, is sent to help her. And they end up having sex. And she wants him to wear a condom. He puts it on. And then at some point he pulls it off. And they continue having sex. Now, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that that was rape, even though looking back now that I know, it's like, oh my God, are you serious? Of course it is. But you don't know what you don't know. And so this was really uh, wild, wild. And because she's had this super visceral, like fucked up experience. And then this was very light of day. You know, she, there, there were not drugs or alcohol in her system. Um, and because she, because this 
other writer, Zane, his name is, comes in to help her, even though he's done this and kind of like convinced her that it's not a big deal, she continues to hang out with him. And it's it's like, oh, I just, I grab my stomach for that one because I feel like that was so me in my uh, in my early college days, it was like just being around a lot of guys and just not knowing, just looking for companionship, you know? And, and, um, so again, like if I had, if I had a, a, a daughter, if I had a son, I want them to, I'd like, no matter who it is, like if they're in your teens or something and you're like, obviously curious about sex and maybe, you know, making out with, you know, like early stages, maybe you've already had sex, whatever. I would want them to watch the show. I really, oh, here I go. Dropping my pen. (laughs) One second. But I really would because it's educational as much as it is storytelling. So... So then in the next episode, it just came up. It's about awareness. And essentially, Arabella is hanging out, you know, at Zane's apartment and she's listening to a podcast in the morning. And the podcast is talking about how men will uh, uh, have a scheme essentially to to do this, to, to have sex with women, put on a condom, then end up pulling it off and then being like, oh, I thought you knew and have like whole Reddit forums and things on like doing this. And it's ugly. It's ugly to, to look at and examine, but damn, like this is, this is what I want my, my kids to know. You know what I mean? So it's wild because, uh, because she realizes, Arabella realizes that she's been, again, she's been raped a second time without even knowing. And damn, like that is not an easy thing to contend with. But when you don't know, you don't know how to protect yourself. So that was the episode five. It just came up. And then episode six is called The Alliance. And this is, again, a trauma memory. So essentially, it's about a classmate of Arabella and Terry's. And she is in school, um, parents divorced. Um, she has a, a, a younger younger brother and her, her mother is with... So her name is Theo. And they go back to when they're in middle school. So everyone's in middle school. And so this this girl, Theo, she uh you find you find out uh, should I give it away? Like at this point, like spoil this this whole podcast is spoilers, so whatever. Okay, so by the end of the episode, you find out that her mother had her lie about her father and her father touching her at, at a young age, so her mother would get uh, you know, uh custody of the kids and money or something. And, but it wasn't true. And the mother made her, her daughter lie. And so this is Theo, her daughter. And at school, she has sex with, uh, another student who's black. And it's a really painful interaction because he ends up taking a photo of her with his cell phone, with his flip phone. And it's like, what the fuck? Oh my God. Like, of course, middle schoolers would be doing that. Um, and so she's angry at him for doing that and she feels bad. And so she goes and she cuts herself and then she blames it on the student who she just had sex with. And then, so it gets so tricky because you can look at like from a race perspective, like, like you, you're potentially, you're potentially, uh, slandering, you know, someone's, someone's name and reputation who you had consensual sex with. Um, on the other hand, she was taken advantage of in a way and, and this kid like showed no remorse. So 
it's so tricky, but she ended up lying about him. And then because of the photo, they're able to prove. And it ends up being Arabella and Terry who get wind of the photo and then are able to prove the innocence of the other black, of the black student. So it's super tricky, but we find out that Theo runs a group for survivors of sexual assault and rape. And so in the episode we have today's Theo and Arabella in the context of the group. And, but we also go back into that trauma memory So it's wild because in a way Arabella, you know, told on, on Theo, but also Theo, it's the complexity, the way Michaela Coel presents no one to be the bad guy and everyone is, everyone is, is in a way contributing to this, to rape culture. It's wild. It's so wild. All right. So... So then, so that's the halfway point. Then episode seven is called Happy Animals. And this is kind of an uncovering episode. We find out that Terry, who had left Arabella in Italy, had also the night that Arabella had been out and Simon, her friend, her other friend who she had been out with, Simon, had been on the phone with Terry at some point and Terry said to leave Arabella. He kind of, she, Terry kind of gave... Simon permission to leave Arabella. Now I was still on Simon for leaving her, but we find that information out and it's like, oh, that's, this is so tough because Terry's pr- trying to be a good friend, trying to help Arabella with self-care and doctor's appointments. And, but she, she did some fundamentally fucked up things. So, uh, let's see, where are we? Um, Then episode eight is probably my favorite episode. It's called Line Spectrum Border, and it's about crossing lines. So there's a lot that's been going on with Kwame on this, like as a side plot. But I didn't want to. I wanted to focus more on the Arabella character. So, but basically, Kwame, um, this gay um, man who is just addicted to grinder and sex. he goes and has a sexual situation that turns uh, unconsensual. And he tries to report it, and he has a terrible time trying to report it because the people are not sensitive to the way that gay sex works these days. And it's just it's just so tough to see him go through that. But then he decides he wants to have sex with a woman because he doesn't feel safe with men. And so he has sex with a woman and he doesn't tell her that he's gay until it comes out because she says the F word. So again, complexity, complexity. A character who's good can also be bad. A character who, you know, you just, you don't know. When you don't know, we're all just animals, you know? We're all just like out here doing what we can. And, but with this knowledge around consent and, and, and this stuff like this would have this would have changed a lot for me. <laughs> so I'm I'm glad to be talking about it. Even if not, you know, a lot of people here or a lot of young people here or whoever, but we need to talk about this. So here we are. So this is painful. Essentially, Arabella convinces Terry to buy her a ticket to Italy to go see Biagio. And Biagio, essentially the relationship has fallen apart. And Arabella crosses the line in terms of his boundaries with her because he had not been answering her calls. And then she showed up at his doorstep. And not only that, she took the key. She took the key, let herself in. So, you know, she's searching for refuge and comfort, but you don't just take someone's, like, you just don't do that, you know? And so it's really dramatic the way it plays out. It's so good. It's so well done. I won't spoil how it goes from there, but it's amazing. And, um, and then in the next episode, social media is a great way to connect. There, 
it's, I would say like the final four episodes have the underlying theme of healing. So she is, she's seeing, Arabella is seeing a therapist and her, her company, her, her publishing company has helped her set that up. But, um, she, she doesn't know exactly where to go, how to heal beyond self-care activities like painting and exercising and stuff like that, which she is doing. So she turns to social media and really uh, gets support and connection there for with other people who have experienced similar things. And but we all know social media can be so harmful. And in terms of that theme, it's also really interesting. They they have this doctor's doctor's appointment moment. And Arabella goes online for a second, kind of like speaks to her followers, and then she gets off and she's like back in the room. And then the doctor, um, he, oh, I don't want to give too much away. And then, but then she goes outside and she's on social media and she's doing a video. And her friend, Terry, who's been with her, um, her friend says, you know, she's, she's off, she's off cigarettes and weed she's on the vape now and so she's off everything she's just doing the vape now and the doctor's like well you know the vape is bad for her and she goes doc I think my friend is stressed do you confirm and she goes I think my friend like she goes on this whole monologue it's so good where she's like my friend has been through so much psychological stress and you're telling her to leave behind the vape when she's already cut most of her when she's already cut like drugs and alcohol it's like Yes, vapes can be harmful, but so can the psychological stress of sexual assault and rape and social media. So it was an awesome moment coming from this 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 aspiring actress, black woman to old white doctor being like, see the bigger picture, man. See her as a human and not a patient, man. So good. Um episode 10, the cause, the cure. So it's another trauma memory. And this is around, so she goes home for her mother's birthday. And when she's home, her father, we don't know if he's going to show up. He ends up showing up. They get an extra plate for him. And then he's kind of, uh, overly, uh, jovial and, talking about when his house got broke when the house got broken into their house got broken in oh no it was his house because their parents were separated and essentially Arabella went in through the window somebody saw and saw that they could also get through in through the window so she never knew at the time but then her father essentially was disclosing to her okay yeah you were the reason why the house um why we were robbed, why I had to start over. And it's just too much, you know, what a pile up for someone who's already trying to deal with other shit. So, but also giving so much more context and mother and brother and really good. Episode 11, Would You Like to Know the Sex? is where um, she really has a breaking point. Arabella starts to know where she's going with her book after all, after this big, big break, she starts to know where she's going, what she wants to do with the story starting to put itself together. And, and in the last episode, it's so cool. Okay. So she essentially has three and towards the end, she's going back to the bar and staking it out to to, to find her rapist because the, the uh, murderer always, res- uh, always returns to the scene of the crime. So she goes back to the bar and she is just staking it out. And then from, from these kind of stakeouts, we have three um, different scenarios playing out. So the first is she finds her I'm going to super synthesize and summarize. So the first ending is that she finds her rapist and she kills him. 
the second and and these play out visually. So you think that's the ending. Then we go back to the stakeout. The second ending is that he is arrested. The third ending, she has sex with him, consensual sex with him, and kind of like, uh, f- kind of like fucks him in, from like in yes, but it's all consensual and like good. It's not like violent. Um, and then at the at the very end, like kind of the fourth. She's she's kind of and then at the end of these scenarios, she's putting an index card up on the wall, like tell like showing us that she's writing different endings. So I thought that was so brilliant and so meta how how they were portraying that um, visually. And then we realized, oh, okay, these are three different endings. It didn't for me, it didn't feel confusing. It felt like okay, I get it. And then the very last scenario is where she kind of lets it go. She doesn't go back to the bar. She ends up hanging out with a friend instead and, um, and with her roommate. And, uh, and it's really cool because I do think that the healing, the true healing around, um, trauma is where, is when that trauma no longer holds you back from doing things or scares you or changes your heart rate and stuff. And so to see her go through this process throughout the 12 episodes, it's so beautiful. It's super well done. And um, at the very end, you know, she's supposed to deliver a book from the beginning. So that very end, she finally finishes her book. And the ending, the very ending of the show is her about to read the foreword of her book. Oh, so poetic. So beautiful. Could you ask for anything better? I can't recommend this series enough. And I just think it's so good. It explores friendship, sexuality, consent, sexual assault and rape, um, gray area in relationships, in sexual relationships, you know. And um, and I saw, I went and crept up on her IMDb and I saw that she is doing so that so she's got another show coming out and it's called January second and it's with the same character she's playing Arabella so it's the same show under a different name and January second is what she called the book that she wrote as the character Arabella in the show so it's. I cannot wait to see where she goes with this. I worship, I really, I worship this woman. I think she's so special. I'll drop the link to her Metagart lecture. It's basically like the Ed- Edinburgh, Edinburgh, oh, I don't know. It's out in the UK, some TV organization of high honor and nobility that she was invited to speak. And of course, she's the youngest who's ever been invited to speak and all that stuff. Um, but this lecture is just so special. So I'll drop that in the notes if you if you want to just see who she is for an hour before you commit to the show. But really incredible stuff. All right, I will keep it moving, but sending so much love out to Michaela Coel, and you best believe we're going to be talking about January 2nd when it comes out. All right, let's move on. Movies. Film. Okay, and finally for our film section, I want to talk about a short film I found on Hulu called Star Keisha. Uh, Star Keisha is written, directed by Mo McRae, and he's been involved, I think, in some like ESPN stuff. So I I haven't quite figured it out, but essentially ESPN was part of the production of a series, volume one, two, and three since 2020, called Music for the Movement. And so I'll I'll drop the link to the Spotify playlist um, in the show notes. So... Yeah, so the, this music, it's great music by great artists, Chloe Bailey, Chloe, uh, yeah, Chloe Bailey, Toby Nguigwe, um, just just incredible artists having either covered or doing r- original music having to do with um, black folks and, and 
what's going on? So, so ESPN funded that, uh, project. And then Mo McRae wrote and directed this, this short film. And essentially it's kind of like a visual album for, for, uh, a bunch of the tracks from the Spotify playlist. So it doesn't use all of them and it's only 30 minutes long, but, um, okay. So it's, it's like a visual album and it stars Dom Chanel. I'm pretty sure this is her first, it says introducing Dom Chanel. So pretty sure this is her first starring featuring role and she plays star Keisha. So this is a story about black girl magic and it is so beautifully done. It's very vibey and it's very healing and, and, and positive. And so again, anyone can benefit from, from seeing this and seeing these stories. And, um, so, so it begins with star Keisha Mary Jenkins, who at this point in the film is wearing her hair relaxed or wearing a wig. Um, she's going by Mary and she's about to interview for this like a uh, law firm, I think. And so she, she says the line, call me by my middle name, Mary, when she's practicing for her interview with this law firm. And it's very sucking up to the man. Then she gets on the phone with her friend. She's telling her friend about the interview. And the friend's like, oh, old guard, huh? It's very, <laughs> it's very like, oh, damn, girl. I mean, take it easy on her. Um, but but we get where this is going. So uh, she's very, you know, if I get this, I won't have to worry about much. Um, and her friend says, well, don't trip, you know. Put on your professional voice, which oh, at some point we'll watch. Uh, we'll talk about. Sorry to bother you. One of my favorite movies, which talks about the white voice, the prof- professional voice. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, she goes, "Don't trip." Then she ends up tripping on a puddle on the floor, and she's knocked into this world where it's dark, and there's like she's stuck in this little he- hexagonal or. Um, geometrical sort of mirrored uh, box or or circular situation. And so it's wild. She essentially has this mirror version of herself. So very, you know, we've seen this a lot before, of course, with Issa Rae and Insecure. Um, the mirror version of herself is the doubtful voice and kind of represents that. So the voice is kind of like, you can't get out of here. Like, you need to get back to the interview, da 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 But Starkeisha's like hearing a narrator. And that narrator is pushing her and telling her to keep going and telling her positive things. And so, uh, you know, her first, her first instinct is, I need my hair and my clothes back. <laughs> and... Uh, and it's so great. It's like, oh, baby, it's very um, Wizard of Oz, you know? It's like you're going on a journey and you are going to be so different by the time that you get back. You're not even going to wa- want your hair and your clothes. So the narrator says, you have to let yourself out. And it's about making that journey into awareness. So uh, she she starts to believe, she starts to believe and the narrator says something like, it doesn't, it matters, um, it doesn't matter if you, if you don't make it out, like you still should jump and get as high as you can, you know, even if it's not high enough, it's still worth something. So she jumps, then she's immediately transported into the desert. So it kind of feels like the twilight zone, but it kind of feels like some Afro futurist twilight zone. And soon there's music and there's sounds and there's other people and there's dancing, lots and lots of dancing. And it's beautiful, the music. Um, and then she gets, and then she gets transported again into this, 
Okay, so remember in Black Panther when uh, T'Challa is like on ice and like in the dream world or in the like um, after world and everything's kind of like purpley blue and stars in the sky and like glowing. So it's this kind of scenario and this is about her inner beauty and so it's this whole bit and there's all these like women in white robes and turbans and, and being there and laughing and sharing moments and she experiences this 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 beauty, this inner beauty. Then the narrator tells her to climb into this box. So she climbs into this box and this box disappears. She drops into this concrete building space where there's a big mirror. And her mirror self says, um, says, let's just stay where it's safe. I want to protect you. And so is kind of this self of like, you know, you can go out and be bold and be your, do the, the, but you can, but it's better, it's more safe and more protected if you stay with me. So she kind of gets sucked into this mirror world where there's, it's kind of splashy. There's like two or three inches of water on the ground and, um, not immediately, but then, but then eventually, the two selves, you know, her mirror self and herself get into conflict. And so they're starting to fight. They have this fight scene. Um, and then, but then she finally, Arkisha, you know, she gets this, it's like, use your magic, the narrator tells her. And then she like kicks, kicks ass. She's like, I'm leaving here. I'm, I'm going to go through you. And she jumps through her doubtful self. So symbolic and she lands on the other side back in this concrete building and the, the narrator appears in front of her and um, and she says, you know, Sarkisha says, I never believed in magic until now. And, um, and the messages, you know, are follow your heart and it's okay to love yourself and it's so beautiful and it ends in this incredible dance video. So it's like a music video. Um, and damn, Dom Chanel can really dance as well. And so she's wearing her natural hair and colorful, like, um, African inspired garb. And she's with a big group of people and they're dancing. It feels like a colorful ass flash mob. And then, um, at the very end, they kind of zoom in on the photo of them all in formation. And it's this magazine cover, you know, and she started her own, she's like an up and comer, she started her own thing. And so I really needed this. I really needed this project as I was, as, as, as I have been telling you, I needed it. I needed to feel it. Uh, I need, I needed that warm fuzzy and, um, that warm fuzziness. And yeah, I think I'm going to go back to this when I need it, like, I think this is going to, I think I might have like a little self-care vault of things to put on in different categories, but I would definitely put, put this in there because it's, it's, it's like, it's hard. It's hard to go out and be yourself and make it on your own. And in the, in the beginning of the film, Starkeisha is saying that she's saying, yeah, it's too hard. I, it's too hard to start my own thing. But before the, this ending dance sequence, she comes to on the floor and her friend, um, she's on the phone with her friend and she's like, you know, you can call me Star Keisha. And her friend is like, it took, the, it took you falling and hitting your head to be real with me. And she's like, I guess. And, but I think, I think as black women, um, we, the world has such a specific narrative about black women that there's a lot to sort through and wade through. Um, and you realize, oh, wow, so much of this is bullshit. And then you get to the other side and it's like, okay, I can be myself. It's not going to be easy, um, but I, I can be myself and not conform. And this this freedom to be yourself a theme, you know, I, I struggle with it like every day, even though I love who I am. I really do. I appreciate myself. And I think my younger self would be proud of who I am as well. Um, I 
still have so many doubts. And, you know, the music industry right now is so, uh, it's not looking good. But that that doesn't mean that I'm not going to make music. It doesn't mean, it just means take some time, go back into your shell, reflect, review, um, relax, rejuvenate, and, you know, rest. And, and that's where we, that's when we'll center ourselves, you know? So for me, I feel like at first I was like on this grind and it was before I I was aware of my self-care as well. And then COVID really, you know, like, like, like all of us or like many, many people slowed me down to the point where I saw that I was traumatized and then I saw I needed to focus on my healing and that that's the most important thing. And and if there's no more music after I heal, then there's no more music after I heal or when I get to a good point in healing. But it's, we, we constantly have to check in with ourselves and assert who we are and constantly check in with who that is. And it's a lot. It's a lot. So this was really special. Um, you know, it's not a commitment like Black is King level, even though I'm such a stan of Black is King, even though with the criticism. <laughs> um, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice little 30 minute journey. And so I can highly recommend Star Keisha if you're thinking about it, if it's on your watch list. Okay, I'm going to conclude that as the film section. We'll move over to the outro. Hey, listen, sometimes you got to check in with yourself. Check in with yourself. Ooh, okay, so we're in the outro section. Um, I want to talk about recovery and, and healing. Um, I think I shared last week that I did a, or, well, it's still technically this week, but, um, a seminar on PTSD and I, and I really became aware of what it is, which is, you know, when your stress from traumatic events, which we all have, gets you stuck, gets you in a place where you're stuck and then it becomes, it goes from PTS to PTSD. You can be experiencing PTS for like three to six months, I think. But then after that, it's PTSD. So, um, yeah. And then I, I did this, this second session where it, where the, the doctor talks about, or the therapist talks about recovery and healing. And, uh, and I studied psych in school when I was at the university of Pittsburgh. And so I remember, you know, some of this stuff. And, um, I had a friend who, um, had a traumatic event and needed, uh, EMDR, which, uh, oh God, what does it stand for? Um, motion, I motion, d- damn it. Okay. I, for- I forget. I'll just do a quick Google EMDR. Okay. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, so I've known about EMDR and yeah, it's essentially where you're, you're being told to look at images and you're, you're kind of like your eyes are moving around as you recount memories or feelings and things. So training you to not have the same, um, traumatic triggering that you would have. It's, it's reframing these memories or retraining your body to react differently to the memories. So it was, it was cool to hear about that. And also like check in nowadays with where we're at with like CBT, because for instance, CBT wasn't a huge thing when I first went into therapy in 2007. And then it was a thing the next time I was seriously in therapy. And now it seems like there's developed aspects and then pertaining to PTSD, they even have like more specific things. So like prolonged response. I didn't realize that this was a, a, um, part of cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's like, uh, I don't, 
I don't know exactly. I didn't, yeah, I didn't write down the definition, but I think it's this similar idea of like recounting your memories and working with the therapist to, to, to reframe them so that you don't have this triggering response. So, uh, it was really wild because after that session, I sat, it was probably the next day I sat and I wrote in my notebook, I'm 33. So I wrote from one to 33, the numbers in a vertical line in my notebook. And I wrote down, you know, the traumatic events and I've, I've never done that before. And it was hard. And, and I also, I think because of having, not only being from parents who essentially were kind of, you know, now they're divorced, but they weren't when I was growing up. Um, not only that, but then the racial component as well. And being the, the femme, you know, the woman, the girl, the older sister, you know, um, I, I think, yeah, that, that, that in and of itself was stressful. And my first way of manifesting my stress, my, my PTS was, uh, eating disorders. So I'm not going to go like super deep into it, but it was just wild to take stock of my life and be like, okay, wow, I can trace my depression back to my childhood. Okay. And basically all this time I've been stressed and I haven't known how to heal from that stress. So it was really hard and emotional doing it. But then now I feel like I have so much power in the knowledge of understanding how to recover. And even though I've tried multiple forms of therapy and um, medication and a lot of different things, I'm like, okay, there's still more treatment options to take. And that's so exciting. It's like being diagnosed with, I mean, I haven't had my official diagnosis, but I'm pretty sure I have endometriosis still waiting to get into the health system. But, um, it's so nice to know what you're dealing with. And I think similar to the themes, some of the themes in this episode where these, these people were dealing with their, their trauma and dealing with hard shit. Um, it's such a process, but the art can really be a a part of it. The art can be, um, a way, a, a way to like journal, to, 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 to go through it. And that's what it is for me. That's what music has always been for me. It's been trying to lift myself out of my post-traumatic stress. So yeah, I don't know if all this makes sense. I don't know if any of this resonates with you, but, um, but yeah, I really wanted to share. I also wanted to share, I did, you know, when things just pop up randomly, like it's, it was one of those things where I was on the toilet and randomly my phone was on Eventbrite. I maybe had been looking for a ticket for something. Not that I have any money to spend on going out to whatever, but I see that there's this modeling, uh, free workshop in San Francisco and, um, I've done photo shoots and stuff, but I've never like tried to model before. So I was super interested and it's free and I'm all about free shit. So went to the workshop. It's with this guy, Charleston Pierce, this black man from the hood. And he, he did it at this theater that was also like, like around, like around the corner from where he grew up and just so, down to earth. And he was like, this is the first stage that I got on when I was 14 and all that stuff. So he challenged us. It kind of felt like a RuPaul's Drag Race episode, um, without any eliminations. Um, but the, the challenges and learning poses and walks and collaborating choreography with group. And it was so awesome. And I feel like, damn, this is part of my healing, being able to go to this, being able to put myself out there in a group of other people. I was the only adult wearing a mask, um, which feels weird still navigating that. But yeah, it felt awesome. And I think as I do this healing, I'm going to see a direct, like positive side, 
spike up. So yeah, just passing on that energy of healing. You know, it's still International Women's Month and um, and yeah, obviously we're going to keep it super femme um, with things and everything, but I really wanted to make an effort to honor women and our struggles and our, our hardships and how badass we are. And, and also I'm, I say like women, I'm, I mean like the queerest, most inclusive like version, you know, I'm talking about trans women. I'm talking about non-binary folks. I'm talking about, you know, anyone who can identify with the femme experience. So that is all I have for you. Um, I feel caught up now and, uh, and yeah, we're going to keep rolling. Thank you so much for, for tuning in and, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me on Patreon about anything in the podcast. All right. Wishing you a great spring and, um, honor the femmes in your life. Bye. I've been in low, 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 low power mode. In low power mode. Been in low power mode all year. Think it's time to switch it up to high gear. I've been in low, 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 low. I've been in, 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 in. I've been in, I've been in low power mode all year. Think it's time to switch it up to high gear.